May in Stockholm. It's that special time of year when Swedes hit the streets after the long, dark, cold Swedish winter. But the spring, they're asking themselves, who's got the coronavirus and who's immune? The government's taken a risk by keeping the country open. Ensuring broad immunity for Swedes as soon as possible is an aim of chief epidemiologist Anders Tegnell. But only 7.3% of Stockholm's inhabitants have developed antibodies to the virus, so few have been infected. That's the interim result of a study conducted by the state health authority at the beginning of May. The percentage is less than they hoped for. A reason to rethink the strategy? No, says Anders Tegnell. I think the Swedish strategy has proven to be sustainable. I mean, we get figures now that people are actually increasing their their adherence to our advice, not decreasing. There is a high level of acceptance in the Swedish population for what we do. Tegnell assumes that almost a month after the study, about 20 percent of the population in Stockholm has now developed immunity to the coronavirus. But critics say that with some 4,000 deaths in a population of 10 million, Sweden has one of the highest corona mortality rates in the world. The immunization rate for children and young people nationwide was only 4.7 percent, far below the Stockholm average. The Swedish government hopes a vaccine will soon be available. It will certainly take some time before we get there. But when we are there, Sweden will have access to that vaccine. And we have a plan for who should be vaccinated and in what order. Vaccination would be safer than natural immunization. And it's neither clear whether those infected with a coronavirus really are immune, nor for how long. David Navarro is the COVID-19 special envoy at the World Health Organization, and he joins us now. Good to have you with us. So uh, we hear every day about the latest case numbers. We know the number of those who died and those who are cured. But how many are immune to COVID-19 by now? The case numbers that we have are actually a reflection of the number of people who've been tested and found positive. There are probably many more people who've had COVID than these numbers suggest. Now, the question is, if you've had COVID, are you also immune to getting it again? There was some uncertainty about this a few weeks ago, but it looks as though if you've had COVID, you do have a degree of immunity. How long does that immunity last? We don't know. So I'm going to be a little bit imprecise here and say that the actual number of people who've had COVID and who are immune to COVID in any community is not fully known. Mm. And because we don't think that large numbers of people have COVID without symptoms, we suspect that probably the number of people who have COVID is as many as the number of people who've had symptoms of COVID. And in most populations, that does not seem to exceed 10%. Right. That's now, my professional answer to that question. That, that, that also means that the number of immunity could be higher than what we know already. But at the same time, you mentioned it already, we don't know how long this immunity lasts. And a study from the University of Amsterdam says that they think immunity to reinfection from coronavirus may only last six months. That means immunity is at best only temporary. I think so. I wish that there was uh, more precision in answers to this kind of question because it's absolutely essential when governments are making policy about whether or not they are going to have things like passports that show uh, whether or not people are immune. So right now we do not know how long uh, immunity lasts, if there is immunity. And secondly, we don't know whether everybody gets it. So we have to continue behaving as though Even if you've had COVID, you are still at risk of getting it again. And where does this leave countries like Sweden or at some point also Britain who were aiming for herd immunity? Has that approach failed? I think that the UK does not wish to suggest to anybody that aiming for herd immunity was a policy. It was an idea that was suggested in a number of press briefings in March. So I don't think any country in the world is actually saying 
we should aim for herd immunity, i.e. letting everybody get the infection and then hoping that immunity builds up in the population. The costs of doing so in terms of lives lost and in terms of overloading of health services is very great. Right. So I do not believe this policy is being used anywhere at this time. And of course, we all hope that ideally there will be a vaccine. But as we also know, yes. that could take a while. And I'll ask you about that in a moment. But first, a quick look at where we stand. Over 130 research teams around the world are racing to develop a coronavirus vaccine. Some are using an inactive version of SARS-CoV-2. Others are using genetic sequences from the virus. A dozen of the teams have developed serums to test on humans. Their success can move financial markets. Stock in US firm Moderna surged after reports its vaccine had triggered an immune reaction with little or no side effects. But the shares plummeted when reports emerged the vaccine's effectiveness was exaggerated. Researchers need to run tests on thousands of subjects in any vaccine study to obtain meaningful results. That takes time. Experts predict a vaccination could be approved by the second half of 2020. David Nabarro from the World Health Organization. Vaccines can take years, but if one becomes available this year, would you take it? I'd want to know a lot about the vaccine before I decide whether or not I'm going to take it. First of all, has its safety been demonstrated in a variety of different individuals? particularly in individuals who've had COVID before, uh, are they going to get a hypersensitivity to it? Has its efficacy been demonstrated? Does it provide immunity that protects against infection against COVID? Uh, does it provide long-term immunity or not? Those are the kind of questions I'd want to ask if I was going to decide whether or not to take the vaccine. Now, the more likely outcome, of course, is that uh, there won't be a vaccine uh, for some time. What happens then? Then what we have to do is to learn as humanity to live with the constant threat of this virus. We'll need to modify our behavior, including physical distancing and also taking great care of those who are most at risk. And also we'll need to be able, when necessary, to take focused action to restrict movement and to deal with outbreaks when they build up. But as we've learned, if you do this quickly and you do, if you do this robustly, life can go on. We don't need to have more lockdowns. All right. Life can go on. I like that message. David Navarro there from the World Health Organization. Thank you so much. And now it's time for our science correspondent, Derek Williams, to answer some of your questions. I've heard deaths from other pathologies are sometimes being classified as COVID-19. If that were true, wouldn't it be reflected in fewer deaths from other pathologies? Tracking deaths and exactly what caused them has proved very challenging in this pandemic. We, we mostly hear about how many people have tested positive for COVID-19 and how many people have died from it from those people who tested positive. But, but those statistics only reflect how many people are being tested, not how many people are actually sick or how many actually die due to the disease. Um, a more accurate overview could probably be based on what's called all-cause mortality, uh, comparing numbers of how many people die in a specific place over a specific period. Uh, those are numbers that we can track accurately. Um, like researchers did in a recent study looking at a small town in, in northern Italy, it showed that at the height of the crisis there in March, people were dying over 10 times more frequently than they did in the town on average during that month. Now, that's pretty eye-opening. There were many, many more deaths across the board, and many of those deaths were not necessarily being counted as COVID-19 victims because the people who died weren't tested. How many mutated COVID-19 strains have been identified? Viruses mutate regularly, and, and if those mutations cause major differences in their virulence or their transmissibility, experts begin talking about different, different strains, like they do with influenza. But, but strains is kind of a vague term in the world of virology. Um, some studies have sought to show that, that various lineages of the SARS-CoV-2 family in different parts of the world 
have now changed enough that we can call them different strains. Although there's plenty of evidence of, of evolved changes in the virus at, at the genetic and, and the molecular levels, there isn't really evidence that those changes have altered its biology, what, what's called its serotype, which, which describes how our immune system responds to the pathogen. And for us, that's the key point. Derek Williams is there, and he'll be back to answer more of your questions tomorrow. Just post them on our YouTube channel for DW News. And to keep up with the latest developments on the coronavirus, you can always subscribe to our newsletter. Go to dw.com corona-newsletter and fill out the form.